I don't want to grow up, I'm a curious kid The world has a hundred questions I can play with So I'll open my arms and eyes And wonder every day till the day I die No one really knows why gravity exists Naming something doesn't mean that we get it So I'll... Um, so yeah, today I'm going to talk about uh, data science um, a little bit sort of in general what data science is, and then more specifically uh, talking about what my company does, TV viewing analytics, and how we use uh, other data sets including the uh, U.S. Census data uh, to do our job, to sell our products, to give people better recommendations, and to measure who's watching what on television uh, more accurately than has ever been done before. Uh, so quick introduction to me and data science. Who am I? You heard this, uh, so I'll go quickly through this. Got my astrophysics PhD at uh, Cal, working with Professor Alex Filipenko. Um, was an NSF uh, postdoctoral fellow doing research in astronomy at UT Austin for a few years. And then I decided to uh, leave academia and enter the world of uh, the tech industry through data science. Uh, so I uh, entered the Insight Data Science uh, Fellows Program, a uh, program based in San Francisco. They have locations around the country that basically sort of place uh, academics, people that come from uh, science PhD programs who want to get into big data, data science, data engineering uh, in the tech industry. Uh, and then from that program, uh, I started uh, with Samba TV back in December of 2016, so I've been there for a little over three years. Started as a uh, standard data scientist and then have now worked my way up to uh, director of data science and analytics there. Mm -hmm. Samba TV. We will spend a large chunk of this talk talking about that. So data science, it is a new field. Uh, if you look back at Google Trends, there were basically no uh, searches for the term data science more than a decade ago. And it is a growing field, as you can see from these searches, um, but you can also see uh, from job postings on indeed.com uh, over the past few years. This is a, a couple year old slide now. Um, this is the last time Indeed put this number out, but it's still growing uh, pretty solidly. It's also a desirable field. Uh, if you go to Glassdoor.com and look at sort of the best jobs in America as voted by various uh, people who have jobs, who are hiring for those jobs, recruiters, etc. Uh, data scientist is number one in 2019. It was number 21 in 2018. It was number one in 2017. It was number 21 in 16, 2016. Uh, it was number nine in 2015, but it was still really just getting started back then, so that's fine. So what is data science? If you ask 10 data scientists what is a data scientist, they will give you 12 different answers. Uh, I like to think of data science as sort of four major broad categories. Uh, most data scientists do sort of a combination of these things. Um, but the main categories are analytics. So this is where data scientists use data numbers to try and figure out something interesting or new, whether it's a new result, a new product, or a new thing that we want to show a user, a way to get users to use your product more, retain users, things like that. Uh, that's a lot of what my team works on. There's sort of the product side, the product manager side, where you're creating new products, trying to figure out what people want in the marketplace, things like that. Uh, there's the sort of data engineering side, which is a lot more traditional kind of computer science, coding. Um, you have to understand the data to be able to ingest it and deal with it uh, in the code. Um, but data engineering is sort of its own little flavor. And then machine learning, a lot of people will break out as uh, related but separate to data science, um, or at least one of the subsets of data science. So this is the kind of stuff of uh, computer vision, self-driving cars, the you know little CAPTCHA things to prove you're not a robot. We have uh, a whole subset of data scientists that are working on that kind of machine learning algorithms, trying to teach computers to think, to see, to be pretty advanced. Um, my team mostly works in the analytics space. A little bit of engineering. We have a separate data engineering team at my company, but we do all do engineering on my team. Uh, and a little bit of product. Uh, we have a, a product uh, team that we work with, but we also kind of you know, give our own ideas on products. Uh, at Samba, we don't do too much machine learning, at least on my team. Um, there's some other folks in the company that do some of that. And data science is used in many places. It's less than a decade old as far as the, the field of data science is really concerned, but it's basically used everywhere now and, and is continuing to grow. So, of course, social networking places, governments and nonprofits. You can go to the city of San Francisco's website and get free open data sets on stuff about the city and, you know, try to figure cool stuff out. Uh, the U.S. Census, of course, and I'll talk a bit more about uh, census data later. Um, health obviously in the news recently, um, but a lot of health data scientists, uh, friends of mine that have biology, biochemistry PhDs are in that field now. Uh, of course, everything from gaming to apparel, 
education, media, where Samba TV lives, uh, food, engineering, <coughs> kind of old school uh, engineering, um, and travel. So I know data scientists at basically every single one of these companies. And so just to kind of give a little bit of a, a compare and contrast from my background as a, an academic researcher, academic scientist, and, and how I got into data science or sort of what the similarities and differences are, um, a lot of the stuff is similar. A lot of kind of what you do is pretty similar. So the job of an academic scientist this is a very simplified statement, but I think it's reasonable. So you answer questions with data. Um, a lot of times you collect and clean your own data, you use knowledge of statistics and, and other tools, coding, etc., to discriminate between signal and noise, so a real result and just random noise. And then you convey results to the scientific community. This is writing papers, going to um, con uh, conferences, presenting posters, things like that. So how does that compare to my current job as a data scientist? It's basically the same. The last little bit is different. You convey the results to your team or company. Sometimes you present them to other data scientists at conferences. I've done that. Sometimes you present them to the public, like I'm going to do uh, toward the end of my talk here. Uh, and then this last bullet point usually doesn't come up in academia. Make data-informed decisions that directly impact the product or business. And so that's really sort of closing the loop on this work uh, within the uh, tech industry, within a company. And so there's a lot of similarities, and so a lot of academics, a lot of PhDs with science backgrounds have gotten into data science over the last few years. Okay, so to answer your question of what is Samba TV, here we go. Uh, so Samba TV is data-driven television, so what is that? So Samba TV started in 2008 with one goal, to improve the TV experience for people who watch, broadcast on, and advertise on TV. So here's a map of the US that represents where uh, our TVs are. We have technology and TVs around the country. I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in a slide or two. Uh, we're a little over 300 people and growing. We have offices all over the world. Uh, our headquarters are across the bay in the city, right by uh, AT&T Park. Um, we have a large office in Warsaw, Poland. That's where I was for the last two weeks. I literally landed yesterday, so if I'm a little jet laggy, that's, that's why. Um, we have offices around the US, uh, a couple in uh, Asia, and a couple in uh, around uh, Europe as well. Uh, yeah? First of all, honestly, how do you feel about interruptions like this during mm -hmm. your talk? Uh, fine, totally cool. Yeah? Yeah. I, is that how Warsaw is spelled now? Uh, so that is the anglicized version, version of Warsaw, yes. Oh. And okay. how, how about the other version? Um, oh, so, so Roslav, I actually did put in the correct Ro little L. Roklaw. Yeah, so Roklaw would be an English pronunciation. Roslav would be the pro Polish pronunciation. Okay. So yeah, that one I actually did spell properly because I like the little L with the slash. It's a cool little letter. Um, but yes, uh, Warsaw is spelled in the anglicized version. Uh, we have a number of uh, famous investors over the years. Uh, August Capital, Mark Cuban was one of our uh, initial investors. Uh, Disney is a huge investor in us and uh, one of our closest partners. Um, I grew up in Anaheim, so I'm a big Disney fan. I love showing their uh, logo on our stuff. Uh, the, the folks that founded the company were some of the people that started BitTorrent, for those that remember that service. Uh, and then we sort of acquired people from various other huge companies, a number of startups, a lot from directly from academia like myself. And so what do we actually do? So at the heart of Samba TV is we have content ID software built into millions of smart TVs around the world. And so we use video and imaging processing algorithms to detect what content is on your television screen, and regardless of the source. So if you're watching cable, DVR, you plug in a Roku, Chromecast, uh, Xbox, you're watching a DVD, anything on the TV screen, we try to figure out uh, what you're watching. We also have a team that works on trying to map other connected devices within the household. So we can say, okay, this TV is in a household where there's a couple of cell phones, maybe a tablet, um, a personal computer. We can send, kind of connect that whole experience of what you're watching on TV, what you might do online, um, purchase information, other things that we can get from uh, our, the clients we work with. So of course, here's the part where people start to freak out and think that I'm big brother. <laughs> But we are an opt-in service and we take privacy concerns very seriously, uh, both GDPR in the EU and uh, closer to home in California, the CCPA. And so when you have one of our TV or one of the TVs that we're in, you start it up, you plug it in, you connect it to the internet, one of the screens has about three sentences on it. Basically those sentences say, would you like to opt into Samba TV? That will mean that you're sending us what you're viewing on TV, information about what you're viewing. In return, we're gonna give you uh, recommendations on TV shows you might like based on what you watch and you'll, you'll get some advertisements that are actually stuff you might care about based off stuff you watch. If you want to see the full legalese, you can click on that and read the whole thing. 
And then if you want to uh, opt in, at that point, you have to click over to yes, select yes, and you're opted in. And so that is uh, basically the, the, the top level of, of current standards in how opt-in privacy compliance stuff uh, you can be. So we're pretty proud of that. We do take that very seriously from when the company started. Um, we have awesome TV data. Uh, so we have, like I said, TVs around the country. Um, we're also in a few other countries, but I'll mostly concentrate on uh, our US uh, coverage. Uh, we're in all major metropolitan area throughout the US. That does include uh, all parts of Canada, or, uh, sorry, of uh, Alaska that have uh, TVs in them. Not all of Alaska has TVs, but the southern half does. And so we have devices there. Um, and parts of Montana, where they're sort of the smallest metropolitan areas in the country. Uh, but we have TVs in all of these metro areas. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, just back to Poland. Mm -hmm. does, does that uh, represent all of Eastern Europe? So our Poland office has a lot of engineers and data scientists, and they uh, mostly deal with our European data. Um, we have a very small office in Amsterdam, a very small office in London, but basically all of our European data, at least on the technical side, goes through our Warsaw office. Uh, we can match with online data using this device map of you know what other devices are in the household. If we're working with a third party, we can get information about online behavior. Um, a lot of people have heard of Nielsen ratings. We do calculate ratings, and I'll talk a lot about uh, TV ratings uh, toward the end of the talk. Um, but the number of TVs we have is about 100 to 1,000 times more than Nielsen. So we're just going to be able to do better statistics. Nielsen's been around for a long time. People have heard of him, but we can do better. Uh, we have some real-time analysis, so basically within minutes of what people are watching, uh, we can get some initial results. Within a few hours, I can get pretty basic information of who's watching what. And then we do, of course, longer-term studies uh, as well. And we're in most major TV brands, so I'll go into which those brands are uh, in a minute. All right, so the main thing that I want to talk about that my team works on, um, and where the census data really comes into play, is what's called the research panels. And so what is a panel? So we often want to understand the behavior of a group, let's say every TV household in the entire United States. Well, as much as I want to give a free TV with some technology inside of it to everybody in the United States, that's probably not a good idea. Uh, some people don't want to opt into our service. Some people buy TVs and don't use them. That's fine. But how do we represent then the entire United States when we only have a, a fraction of it with our technology in it, et cetera? And so what we do is we create a panel. And so a panel is basically just a set of TVs where we trust the data, we think they're very good, they're representative, and then we use that panel to kind of represent the entire United States. And that's the foundation of most of our products and analyses. And so what are some things that make a good panel? Uh, we want things to be very representative of the whole United States, because that's what we're measuring. If our panel was just TVs in the Bay Area, I would probably get ratings for MSNBC that were too high and Fox News that were a bit too low, I would imagine. So we don't want to do that. We want to have things nice and spread evenly throughout the country, through different demographics, et cetera. And so the first thing that makes a good panel is size. Usually, bigger is better when it comes to panels. Uh, the more data you have, you can reduce your uncertainty, your errors, things like that. So once you have millions of TVs in your panel, like we do, then you can really have confidence. Reliability, it's not just quantity, it's also quality, right? We want to have lots of data, but if it's not useful, then we have a hard time getting accurate numbers out of it. And so we put in some checks that I'll talk about in a couple minutes uh, to make sure that the data is reliable. And then statistical validity. We want to make sure, like I said, that our panel really does represent the United States as best as we can. And then we can add some statistics on top of that to really make it basically perfectly match uh, the United States uh, overall. And we use third-party data sets like the US Census to do that kind of stuff. All right, so first off, we have lots of TVs to choose from, which is great. Uh, here's sort of, uh, over time, the various uh, types of TVs, the companies that we're in. Um, so you see a lot of big famous names up here, not all of them. We're trying to get into every kind of TV out there, but we'll get there eventually. Um, the good thing about this, of being in a variety of TV models and makes, is that there are different price points. Some of these are higher end TVs, some of these tend to be lower end TVs. Some of these are more popular in different parts of the country or in different stores. And so we kind of already have a pretty broad distribution. If we were just in you know, very high-end TVs that are only sold in you know, a few big cities in the US, that's not a very good distribution across the country. But by being in a lot of different TV uh, models and makes and manufacturers, we can cover the country pretty well. So that's already a good start and puts us ahead of some of our competitors. 
So here's the part about selecting reliable TVs. So what do we want to check uh, to make sure that TVs are sending us good data, that we trust them, that we want to include them in our panel? Well, obviously, the very first thing we check is, did you opt in? If you didn't opt in, we don't get any data from you. We shut it all down. We're not getting your information. Yeah? So I have a question about the opt-in and the TVs. If, mm -hmm. Let's say if I had a Sony, which I don't, mm -hmm. how would I know about your service and either the ability to opt-in or not? You would plug in your TV. You would connect it to the Wi-Fi. There would be a screen that says, welcome, this is your Sony. There would probably be some stuff about Sony. Do you want to opt into things? And then there would be a screen with our logo that says, would you like to opt into Samba TV? If you do, then you'll be sending us your viewership data. And it, in return, we'll be giving you uh, information about shows that you might like and ads that might actually be something that you care about and might want to buy. You can click yes or no. And you can click you know, at the bottom and say, you know, I want to read the full legalese, which is the detailed, very long, I forget how many thousand words, but you know, our internal counsel has put that together. So that, that comes automatically if you have one of the, those types of TVs? Mm -hmm. When you turn it on for the first time, you sort of you go through all the setup screens. Yep, that's one of them. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. So is your data in the aggregate, though? It's so, so we get data directly from a device, and we, get, we have an anonymized identifier for that device. So we can tie it back to an IP address, and depending on which country you're in and you know, what the current legal status is, sometimes that is considered personally identifiable, sometimes it's not. In the US, I believe it's still not in almost all places. California, I forget what CCPA says about that, but uh, the, the identifier is anonymized, so we don't know that it's your TV. We know it's some identifier that has a bunch of viewership. Uh, but we can tie it back to an IP address, that's how we match to, match to other devices and things like that. Uh, part of the uh, recent uh, privacy laws is the right to be forgotten. And so that's basically if you say, hey, I opted into Samba TV, I liked it, but now I'm not comfortable with it, or I don't want to use it, or I just want to reset all of my settings with you. You can email us. We have 30 days to basically wipe everything that uh, of your data that we have. And we've done a couple of tests. They worked pretty well. Uh, we still haven't gotten an official request in California, but we're confident that if we do get one of those, we can handle it legally, all that kind of good stuff. Um, so that's one of these new privacy pieces that a lot of places are having to deal with now. So they have to be opt-in, of course. Uh, we want to get consistent metadata, consistent information about the TV and its location. Uh, some people have what are called dynamic IP addresses, where they kind of randomly change your IP address, and we use that to figure out where you are. So if it looks like your TV is bouncing all over the country, that's not reliable. We're not going to use that. Um, if there's other weird stuff about what your TV is sending us, some models, you know, if you have a really crummy internet connection, we might kind of get intermittent data, and so we probably wouldn't use that TV, possibly. We try to get some data out here. Um, we want to stick to just private households. We're in the market for trying to measure television as viewed sort of in a home or in kind of some kind of home setting. So airports, hotels, sports bars, we want to try and filter those out. And a good way to filter those out are, are there 20 TVs at the same location, same IP address? That's Base, not quite 20, but that's one of our filters that we apply here. And reasonable viewing behavior. If your TV is just always off, we might keep it, we might not keep it. If your TV is on 24 or 7, that's probably weird, unclear what's going on. Maybe it's you know a bar with only a couple of TVs or something like that. Um, so there's some other filters that we put in place to try and filter out ones that we don't really trust, that we don't think are actual people in a home actually using their TV, because that's what we want to concentrate on. And we rerun, all, we rerun all of this every week, basically. And so we get the most up-to-date information each week. And so we think that our panel that we're constructing here is always going to be nice and up-to-date and accurate. I have another question. Yeah. How many people actually opt out? Uh, a relatively small fraction. Like under 10%? I can't comment on any exact numbers. So what does the panel wait? So we've got this list of devices, this list of TVs and households that we think are giving us good data, that we trust, that we like. And so uh, what is the next step? Well, the next step is applying a weight. And so no, we're not actually weighing your house. Um, but what we do is we have to kind of assign a weight to each household and how they represent the entire population. So a very simple example, let's say we have uh, three households in our sample population. You know, this is three households that have a Samba TV that have opted in, they're sending us good data. Now let's say there's a total of 90 households in the population, so the whole country is 90. All right, small, but for the example, it makes the numbers work out easily. 
So what we can do is we can figure out a weight for each of those households where I add up the weight of all of the households in the population, or in my sample population, and I get the total population. And so another way to think about this, and the way that I like to think about it is, each sample household, each Samba TV, is gonna represent 30 households in the US overall, in this very simple example. And so we need to calculate these weights for every Samba TV household, and then that will represent the entire United States. And so how do we do that? Well, one of the more complicated things that my uh, team has worked on is uh, using this algorithm called Iterative Proportional Fitting, or IPF. Uh, it's sometimes referred to as raking. And so the idea here is, uh, I'll step through an example in just a minute, but basically when you have multiple uh, features that you're trying to balance or that you're trying to combine, so in our case it's multiple demographic features that I'll get into, and geography. We want to balance all of those simultaneously so that the weights all add up to the US Census data and add up to the whole United States. And so this is a kind of algorithm that can do that. Um, it's known as raking because you kind of go through repeatedly and kind of rake through all of your uh, features and all of your numbers. Um, this is actual footage of us trying to go through this process. It was a bit painful. You deal with a lot of rakes. I'm a big Simpsons fan, so we have a few <laughs> Simpsons jokes. Okay. So what is this algorithm? So I'll sort of step through a, a, an example of how to do it. It's a little bit in the weeds, but you know this is a sciencey crowd, so let's go for it. So we start off with a weight of one. We recalculate these weights for a certain demographic uh, feature. So in this case, age. And then we can do that for another demographic feature, let's say ethnicity. Step through all of those, and then we can kind of keep going until adjusting the weights slightly, until the weights don't adjust anymore. We converge, and we're done. So for an example, let's look at Nashville. We sort of look metro area by metro area. So we look at Nashville, every house gets a weight of one. And then we look at the ages of people in those houses. And we look at the census data for Nashville and the ages. And then we scale each of those up and down so that we get the exact representation, the distribution of ages in Nashville. We have a set of weights, great. Now let's move on to ethnicity. We can look at the ethnicity of each household, compare that to the ethnicity in Nashville, and we can adjust those weights again to make all of the ethnicities add up. Now we've adjusted the weights, so that probably screwed up the ages. And so we can do that for a bunch of demographics, and then we repeat this process. And we kind of keep tweaking these weights over and over until you add up all of the weights and we get the right number of people in Nashville, the right number uh, of people of each ethnicity, each age bucket, um, gender, and income. And those are our main demographic features. So we do that, we converge, we get our weights. We do the same thing for Fresno. We do the same thing for every major metropolitan area, uh, every metro area in the US. Uh, there's about 210 of them. And so then, at the end of this process, we have a weight for each household that is a Samba TV household. And so we can think of each of those Samba TV households as representing that many US-wide households that have the same demographics in the same geographic location. Okay, so why should we do all of this hard work? Why make things complicated? Why not just do like my first example of take however many people there are or households in the US, divide it by how many TVs we have, call it a day. Well, a lot of previous panels did kind of stuff like that, uh, including TV viewership ones. And what happens is, and even if you do a little bit more complex stuff than that, if you don't take into account all of these different demographic features, you're not gonna represent the current true US population, and therefore you're gonna get inaccurate measurements. And so a viewership data set from many TV manufacturers, like I said, all these different brands that we're in, plus our uh, interproportional fitting panel, panel balancing method that I just went through, is what you really need to create a panel that accurately represents the population according to the US Census. So if you want to get the right answer for who's watching what and represent the whole US, you've got to go through all these steps. Okay, so let's get into some results of uh, the building our panel and of uh, all this methodology. So just as a quick reminder, step one, we have a whole bunch of TV manufacturers that we're in. Step two, we select the TVs, make sure they're sending us good data, that they're stable, that they've opted in, of course, all that. And step three, we do that weighting and balancing, that whole uh, iterative proportional fitting, and assign weights to all the households. So then we get these very small percentages. So what are these? This is the range of difference in distributions between our household panel and the US Census based on gender, age, ethnicity, income, and geography. So basically, after going through this process of raking and balancing and weighting, we can make our sample of a few million TVs in the country look almost identical to the entire US population based on the census. So looking at gender, 
we have a bar chart. It's a very boring bar chart uh, because the red is our pa panel, the Samba panel, and the purple is the US Census. And you see that our gender breakdown nearly identically fits uh, to the US Census. We're off by about 0.01%. Uh, put in another way, that's one out of 9,500 households. That's how far off we are. And that's basically like our worst of all these metrics. So we'll do this for a few different demographic um, features that we use. So if you look at these age buckets, again, we're off by 0.003%, one in about 30,000 households. <coughs> Our panel differs by household ethnicity by uh, an even smaller, a slightly uh, bigger fraction, but not by much, one in about 19,000 households. Uh, for household income, we're nearly at zero, 0.0002% difference. That's about one in almost half a million households. And then now, yeah. Jeff, I'm sorry, but you're comparing Samba's um, success against the census data mm -hmm. with regard, let's say, to gender mm -hmm. and, let's say, ethnicity. Mm -hmm. but how does it get that initial data, if, it not, if not from the census? When I turn on my Sony TV, it doesn't mm -hmm. ask me, or it does, ask me my age, no. my, my gender. So, how? so it comes from uh, third-party demographic information. Basically, it's the credit cards. So Experian, Epsilon, these kinds of companies have a lot of information about everybody, basically. And so we can use them as a third-party independent data matching provider. And companies do this all the time. If you've used a credit card, you're in the system, they have a lot of information on you. And so we can send our identifiers, our anonymized identifiers to Experian. Experian does an anonymized matching and sends us back information about our Samba TV households. And so we know this demographic information about all of our Samba, a large fraction of our Samba TV households. And then we can say, okay, that's who's in this household. Now I need to scale all of those to match the census data overall. Yeah? Census collected every 10 years. Mm -hmm. We're almost 10 years away. Mm -hmm. How accurate is the comparison at this point? That's a great question. So I've been very careful to say census data and not the census. And it's a subtle distinction because the U.S. Census Bureau actually does put out updates every year. It's not the full decadal census that we're ramping up for, but it's an update that's sort of, you know, they update some of the major characteristics like age, gender, ethnicity, and income, uh, a few others as well. And so we use those annual updates. So at most, our census data is going to be a year out of date. There'll probably be a huge update, obviously, after the decadal census is done, you know, whenever it's finished, you know, a year and a half from now, two years from now. Um, but the sort of incremental each year, they do update some of the basic information. So, yeah, really good point. Yeah, if we were using 10-year-old census data, that would be really bad. Okay, and then looking at geography, we're nearly perfect. Uh, here's the map of the U.S. broken out by uh, these major metro areas, basically where your local TV affiliate is. Uh, so as you can see, like I said, there's only part of Alaska that's covered, oddly enough. Um, but this is like the most boring map we've ever seen, right? It's all kind of one mushy gray color. There's a couple of lighter pieces, there's a couple of darker pieces. Uh, and you can see the legend here that basically this middle color is we match to the U.S. Census of how many TV households are in each of these uh, metro areas within 0.02%. And in fact, the actual, actual difference, the average difference is way smaller than that. And so we're about good to about 1 in 3.3 million households, um, meaning that we have TVs all over the country, and a lot of them, and we can match nearly perfectly to the US Census data. OK, so now that we have this really good research panel, I've told you how we build it. I've showed you how good it is, how much it matches the US Census. So let's talk about some use cases and case studies. What do we use this panel for? Well, one kind of technical thing that we use the panel for uh, is something called segment extension. So when I talk about a segment, I'm talking about a part of the population that watches a certain show or channel. And so, as you might imagine, one of our big segments is NFL viewers. Who watches NFL football on TV? That's a segment that we have. And so you can kind of picture this in a uh, Venn diagram where we have all TV households in the US. Some subset is Sama TV households. And then some subset uh, that is on both sides of this is NFL viewers. Some NFL viewers have a Samba TV and they're opted in. Some NFL viewers don't have a Samba TV. This is not to scale. I should have put that as a good scientist. I should have put that at the bottom of the uh, slide. Not to scale, but this is basically our setup. 
And so what we can do is we can say, okay, well, for the Samba TV households that are in this NFL viewer segment, that are NFL viewers, we have their viewership information. This is what Samba TV collects from the TV when you opt in, is what you're watching. And then we have location and demographics through this third-party provider and all the stuff that I was talking about. And we have lots of other information as well. But on the other side, non-Samba TV households that we would classify or that we think should be NFL viewers, well, we have a lot of this other information. We have the location demographics. We have this information from uh, the census, from third-party providers, et cetera. But they're not a Samba TV's household. We don't have their viewership. And so that's the kind of missing piece between the two. And so another way to kind of show this here, we have the NFL viewers that are Samba TV households and then the non-Samba households. We have all this information, but we don't have viewership for the Samba TV folks. And so we can use machine learning, and this is done by another team, I worked a little bit on this, but this is one of the big uses that we have of this demographic US census data. We can use machine learning to basically take all this information and predict if other households out there might be NFL viewers. You may not have a Samba TV, but you might have other characteristics that make you a potential NFL viewer. So as sort of a very simple example, we could look at your location, your gender, your age range, and your income. And we'll have some people that are Samba TV uh, households that are in the uh, segment of NFL viewers, some that aren't. And then we have non-Samba households that are NFL viewers. We don't know they're NFL viewers. And some non-Samba households that are not NFL viewers. We don't actually know the right answer, but we know that they have similar demographics. And so if you believe that these demographics and other information about a person can predict what they watch on TV, then we can build a model to predict are you an NFL watcher or not? Even though we don't know what you're actually watching on TV, you don't have a song on TV. And so we can test, we can do that model, and then we can test it. And the way that we can test it is we can kind of test it on ourselves. We can use our own Samba data and put it through the model and say, okay, does this predict that you're an NFL viewer or not? And then we can say, okay, well, you're a Samba household. We know your viewership. Do you watch the NFL or not? So we can kind of check our work. We can grade our own homework. And so the main way that we do this, and this is getting a little bit into some data science-y technical stuff, but basically we can take all the data that we use to build our model, what we call the training data, we can train the model, and then we leave a little portion on the side to test with, and then we check, you know, what percentage did we get right? Did we predict everybody to be, you know, correctly NFL or not NFL viewer? Did we get a half right? What did we do? And then we can kind of do the same thing. We can use, we can leave out this other chunk as our test data, and then train a new model. Same idea, but we train a different model with different data, test on different data, and then what did we get right? And then you can kind of just do this for all your chunks of data. You can combine all these percentages, take some kind of average or something. And this method is called cross-validation. If you have a big set of data, you want to know how good your model is based on that data, this is a pretty typical way to test that, uh, a pretty standard data science technique and something that we do in-house. Sort of in pictures, this is the way the whole thing works. We take our historical data of who watched the NFL and demographic information about them and other information about them. We train a model. We deploy the model out into our production servers. And then we can make predictions. And we can say, OK, we know the sum of people that are in or out of the NFL viewers segment. And if we have third party information on people but not Samba households, we can then predict, are you in the household? Uh, or sorry, are you an NFL viewer or not? So that's sort of the basic step. But you can do better. You can take this information, you can feed it back into your historical data and see, how did we do? We can constantly update the model. We can take live data from people watching you know, NFL, right? People's viewing habits change with time. Your team sucks this year, your team is awesome this year. Maybe your team made it to the Super Bowl for the first time in a decade this year, and suddenly everybody in the Bay Area is watching football again. So because we have this feedback loop, we can constantly make this model better, we can retrain it, we can redeploy it, and then we can make these predictions for, you don't have a Samba TV, we don't know what you watch, but we think you're an NFL viewer. So if the NFL comes to us and says, hey, I want to advertise to people on their smartphones about NFL stuff, we can say, well, here's a bunch of Samba households, and here's some possible non-Samba households that we think you might want to uh, send advertisements to. So that's one piece of our business. So let's talk about the robustness of our research panel. So it's big, we put all this effort into making it match the US Census, and so what does this mean? Specifically, I want to talk about the sort of size of the panel. So let's say we have company S, picked for no real reason, but uh, we have a three million size panel in company S. Company N, again, letter picked completely arbitrarily with no thought for any other historical companies that are around, and they have a 60,000 sized panel. 
There are 120 million US TV households. So we can do our simple uh, division. We can just take the ratio. And you find that on average, each uh, household in, for company S has a weight of 37. And on average, each household for company N has a weight of 1867. And so the weights are very different. Each household is going to have a slightly different weight if they do something like we do with this uh, fitting algorithm. But the average is going to be these two numbers. OK, so what? The bachelorette, that's one. OK, so back in July, July 30th to be exact, we had the finale of The Bachelorette. The Bachelor finale is coming up, I believe, tomorrow and the next day for those that are interested. So if I gave this talk a few days from now, I would have updated it. But we're doing The Bachelorette today. 4.5 million US households watch The Bachelorette. It's pretty good. It's, it's not Super Bowl numbers, but it's pretty good for a reality TV show, kind of on network TV, pretty typical. Um, so that's good. That translates to 4.02% of all US households that have a TV watched. So again, pretty solid, not mind blowing, but pretty good for a TV show. Now let's say something happened. Let's say for some reason there was a glitch in the system and these two TV measurement companies accidentally added 300 TVs to this amount. They didn't actually watch the show, but somebody screwed up, they got in there. Or we could be a little more nefarious. One of these companies pays off 300 households to just turn their TV on and leave for the night just to bump up their ratings. How does that affect these two companies? Company S, when you add 300 TVs to their 3 million panel, doesn't make much of a difference. You would calculate 4.03% of, of US households as opposed to 4.02. Not a big difference, no big deal. Company N, with its much smaller panel of 60,000, it would calculate 4.52% of US households. That's half a percentage point higher by just paying off 300 households. So we have a much bigger panel, a very big panel, around 3 million, and so we're actually protected against these kinds of either nefarious issues or potential uh, issues. Okay, I mentioned football earlier. Let's talk about the Super Bowl. Hopefully it's been long enough where people aren't gonna freak out, but we looked at the Super Bowl. We looked at viewership around the country. Um, we mostly concentrated on sort of the biggest uh, metro areas in the country. Uh, we highlighted the, the cities where the teams were from. And so these percentages are showing you relative to the U.S. average, relative to the U.S. overall, uh, what was the viewership in these cities. And you can see Bay Area plus nine and Kansas City plus nine, uh, not hugely over the U.S. average. Over the average, but not by a huge margin. The biggest cities were up in the Northeast here. Uh, you know, some football powerhouses, maybe not football powerhouses, but interestingly enough, people that really wanted to watch football were in the Northeast. Uh, I guess the Seahawks were out, and so people in Seattle actually were less than the average for the US overall. But the only way that we can do this, or one of the reasons that we can do this, is because we have that census data. We have the information of where are the TVs from, and then the census data of how many households are in that area, and we can do our proportional fitting and scale up and say, ah, this is how representative they are, and this is how they average against the US overall. So that was about geography. Let's talk about ethnicity. Specifically, let's talk about award shows. So we also looked at the Oscars uh, last month. And because, again, we have demographic information and we have this panel that's balanced on ethnicity as one of its features, we can figure out the viewership uh, by ethnicity compared to sort of the US average. Uh, Asian households over-indexed the most, whether that was people that were super interested in seeing if uh, Parasite was gonna pull it off or were getting more into the show as it was uh, going, as, a par as Parasite, a Korean movie, was gathering awards, people tuning in later and later. Um, hashtag Oscar so white, Caucasian households definitely over-indexed as well. And then Hispanic and African American households pretty significantly uh, under average uh, in their viewership. Now let's look at a different award show. The MTV Video Music Awards have the exact opposite ordering of the ethnicities. African American households were watching this in way higher numbers than African American households make up the US population. Whereas on the flip side, Asian households were tuning in way less than the US average. Uh, this was back in uh, this past August. And so again, by having this balanced panel that utilizes the census data that looks at and cares about ethnicity and geography and all these other features, we can make these kinds of, uh, we can do these kinds of analyses, post these kinds of results, 
And so if you're looking for a representation of who's watching what kind of award shows or kind of media, if you're you know, thinking as an advertiser and you want to advertise to certain demographics, this is the kind of information that you absolutely need. All right, I couldn't not talk about politics, right? Uh, so we looked at some of the recent debates. Um, so these are the last four uh, uh, Democratic debates uh, before the respective uh, primaries. Uh, and then we have a graph of the millions of US households. So Iowa, New Hampshire were about four, four and change. Uh, Nevada spiked up above 10. It was the most watched debate in years. Definitely the most watched Democratic debate of this cycle. And then we have a little bit of a drop off uh, to South Carolina. Uh, anybody remember or know why the Nevada debate suddenly had a huge influx of views? Bloomberg? Bloomberg. Yeah, it was the first time Bloomberg was on stage. Uh, we actually refer to it as the Bloomberg bump in a couple of uh, articles that we got written about this. Uh, and then, you know, tailed off a little bit, but significantly higher than the previous, uh, any of the previous Democratic debates this cycle. Um, but let's look at income. Uh, another one of the features that we look at uh, viewership information in our uh, demographic panel. And so just looking at the South Carolina debate, this one that was just a, a couple of weeks ago, uh, the viewers of this definitely skewed to higher income households. And so you can see sort of only a couple percent above the average in this 50 to 100K land, um, but above 100K, that's the people who are watching. It was more affluent households who were watching at significantly higher numbers than they represent in the U.S. Census. So, if you're uh, a, a policy wonk or a, a, a you know political fan, take this for what it's worth. How think about minus 14%. So they watched it 14% less than the U.S. average. Okay. So these are all relative to the U.S. average. They out. No, they were. We don't have negative people watching, negative viewership, but relative to the average. So we can talk about them sort of under-indexing or underperforming or underviewing compared to what you would expect if you know that that part of the population watched at sort of similar levels to the US overall. And then the last one I want to talk about, because today is of course International Women's Day, so this is an awesome day to talk about this. Um, just a couple days ago, we released an analysis of 18 female-led uh, television shows that include dramas and comedies, as well as both uh, shows on uh, cable and um, network TV. And so here's our list of 18. Uh, we put this out on our website, uh, which you can go to right there, um, just a couple days ago. Um, but I definitely got to talk about it because it actually is uh, International Women's Day. And so what we found, again, looking at uh, our demographics of who's watching these shows, we analyzed who watches these shows over sort of the last two to three years. Um, a lot of assumptions of people in Hollywood, of course those people tend to be old white guys, but a lot of assumptions say that, ah, you can't have a female-led show or a female-led movie because only women watch it, only girls watch it, it's not going to be watched. We saw nearly an even male-female split in the audiences for all these shows. So that's pretty powerful stuff. Uh, the audience actually skews a bit higher uh, uh, as far as um, household income. Um, we saw sort of the peak of the viewership in this 100K to 150K household income range which is kind of interesting. Again, if you're thinking from an advertising standpoint or if you're thinking from a marketing standpoint, this is people with a fair amount of disposable income. So maybe your female-led show could actually, you know, advertise to people that have disposable income and buy your products. And then this last one was pretty cool. Uh, African-American households watch women-led dramas at a rate 12% above the U.S. average. Uh, so pretty high, pretty significant over-index compared to the U.S. on women-led dramas. Um, I think most of that is due to this awesome person and the show How to Get Away with Murder. Um, a huge African-American following, a hugely successful show. Um, but still, again, looking at the combination of gender, ethnicity, and income kind of all combined is something that we can do using our balance panel and using uh, the U.S. Census data. And so with that, I think we've got some time for questions. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. One of the underlying principles of talk and, and sound of TV seems to be that in information has value, cash, cash value. Mm -hmm. When I opt in, perhaps, to sound of TV, when I purchase that new TV, has there been any thought to the notion of saying, and, Tucker, we will send you a $10 gift certificate. That is my information of value. How about this? What do I, as a, as a user, as a tool, mm -hmm. 
Oh, not a user. Um, what do I get out of Samba TV? So the main thing you get from Samba TV today is recommendations of TV shows you might like based off of shows that you watch. And because we are uh, inside the TV and can measure anything on the screen, we will happily recommend anything across any platform. Netflix has a great recommendation algorithm for stuff you've watched on Netflix, recommending other stuff on Netflix. Netflix is never going to recommend something on Hulu. HBO is not going to recommend something on Disney+. Plus. We're totally agnostic. If you watch The Mandalorian on Disney+, Plus, you like sci-fi, we'll recommend The Expanse, which is on Hulu, or Amazon, I forget, Amazon, right? We'll recommend across all of those based off of what you like. So we have a recommendation algorithm. We give you recommendations based off what you watch and across any of those. So that's our customer value proposition. There has been, um, historically, there has been uh, incentives for people to sign up and opt in to various uh, panels, research panels and things like that. Um, Nielsen will send you $2 or $5 in the mail to become a Nielsen family or fill out forms. Um, if it's $5 or less, there's been plenty of academic studies that show that you get a biased sample of who's actually taking those $5 and filling out your form. So it almost works against you to incentivize in certain ways, uh, depending on how you do it. Um, that being said, there is a lot of talk at our place and other places as well about um, the monetization of your own data. And so as people are thinking more about privacy and about you know, your rights to your data, you know, you can lo you're sort of loaning it or giving it away for free at some level now. You're getting hopefully some kind of product back. For us, it's recommendations. But there's also been thoughts of making it a little bit more of a, a transaction. So I don't want to use the word Bitcoin, but some kind of digital type of currency that says, OK, you've opted into some service. You're giving some amount of data. And maybe there's different levels of how much data you share. You get more of these online token coins. And then those can be redeemed for potentially, you know, in, in uh, real life type things, or potentially, you know, you have enough coins, you can upvote a show you like, and then that, you know, raises it in some, you know, TV measurement kind of world. And we can say, ah, crowd voted, this was the most, you know, upvoted show or something like that. So there's definitely some discussions around, you know, making that customer value proposition a little bit more transactional. Um, but for right now, yeah, the main proposition is you send us some of your viewership data, we'll give you recommendations, and they're across all of these different platforms. Yeah? I had a couple questions. One, are you a public or private company? Uh, so we are still private. Okay. And so you monetize it um, through, for example, selling the data to um, advertisers, right? We sell certain information to advertisers, yeah. And, and so who are the, your other clients, and is any of your data open to the public to see? So none of our data is currently open. We've had some discussions about that because there's a lot of folks in the company that believe in open source, open data, that kind of stuff. So there's definitely some talks about that. Um, sort of all of the last few slides, I think from the Super Bowl stuff onward, that's all public on our blog for free. We tweet it out, we put it on LinkedIn, Instagram. Um, and so that's very, and that's something that my team runs a lot of what I do personally with my time because I believe in trying to share some of those results. It's a little bit higher level. We wouldn't you know, be able to charge anybody for it, but we do want to get that information out there. Like the International Women's Day um, post went up yesterday or two days ago. And so some of that results do get published publicly for everyone to see and we put it on social media. So that is a start. I think we can do more for sure. Um, and then as far as like who are our clients and things like that, basically anyone or any company that advertises on TV or any of the TV networks or show producers. Because they, all of those companies want to know who sees their TV commercials, and then do they act on those, on seeing those TV commercials. So if you have a new you know, police drama, you advertise it on a bunch of channels during other shows, we can say, OK, who saw it, the commercial? Which channel did they see it on? What time of day? What's their demographics? And then did they tune in to the show? How much of that new show did they watch? And then for uh, non-TV clients, if you're Disney, for example, you run commercials for, hey, buy a family for a pack to Disneyland. People see those commercials on, again, various times of day, different shows, different networks. And then Disney will send us anonymized information on who goes to the website and who actually buys tickets, who just visits the website, who actually spends money, buys a ticket. And then again, sort of anonymous third party, we can match that together and say, okay, this household saw a commercial for Disney Parks 
two days later, somebody on a tablet in that household went and spent you know, the $400 for your two people to go to Disneyland. And so we can make that complete connection for Disney and say, ah, this is what you spent on that commercial, and here's the amount that I drove to your website or to buy. And so that's sort of the cycle that we do a lot of our work in. And so that these companies then have some kind of a yearly license fee with you it's a, it's a, some do that, some kind of pay for one-off reports, you know, Disney is a long-term one, but you know, if you're a smaller company, you know, uh, especially if you're a local company, and you're like, alright, we're going to have a big media blitz and do a bunch of commercials, we want to know how it does, we're going to run commercials for three months, we pay Samba for one report on how those three months did, and then, you know, maybe they don't run again, maybe they wait another year or something like that. So it's a little bit of both, yeah. You had a slide there and showing how well you tracked with the uh, census data mm -hmm. and such. Uh, it seems to me like uh, you should probably have more of a discrepancy when it comes to like gender or uh, age um, demographics, given that uh, there's a lot of uh, there's a big you know portion of uh, uh, younger audiences they don't actually watch you know TV on the big screen, but they watch it on. Um, portable devices and such. And so I was wondering, uh, I, I would have guessed that you might not be able to you know, track as well uh, to the younger you know, demographic or, you know, like even myself, uh, I find that I, I watch a lot of my program on a mobile device now and I don't watch, you know, TV. Mm -hmm. And I'm just, you know, did you have any uh, thoughts on that mm -hmm. and how, uh, and why it is that you did track so, you know, uh, well against the uh, census data. Yeah, so there's two pieces of that. So the first thing is I was showing after we applied our proportional fitting and adding in the weights, and so we adjust the weights if for whatever reason, in an extreme example, zero 18 to 24 year olds have a Samba TV. Let's just say that's the example. If it's zero, we're screwed. If it's one, that one 18 to 24 year old will basically represent all 18 to 24 year olds in the country and will match the census perfectly. That's the very simplified example. So when we take into account all of the age buckets, ethnicity, income, gender, and dev um, geography all together, we scale up all of them, we do this iterative proportional fitting over and over and over until we get a good answer for every one of those uh, metrics. And so we can basically get a nearly perfect match to the census even if, yeah, perhaps the 18 to 35 bucket of ages, you know, there are fewer of those with Samba TVs that are watching, but we would just scale those slightly more up. They would have a slightly higher weight, and so they would represent slightly more of those households. And so basically we can do all of those in this big algorithm and then get a near perfect match. The other piece is uh, you live in a bubble. Sorry, Bay Area is a bubble. Uh, when I started this job, people, everybody I knew was like, who's watching TV on, you know, a TV anymore? Well, 90% of the country. Uh, there are lots and lots of very interesting studies of uh, the number of smart TVs is growing, the num as people are, you know, even older folks or less tech savvy folks or people in more rural areas are replacing older TVs, they're getting smart internet enabled TVs. Uh, accessibility to high-speed internet is improving and increasing even in rural areas so people can connect their TV and actually get a good stream. And the vast majority of the country still watches most of their TV on the biggest screen in the house. It's true, things are changing and certainly it's highly subjective of where you live and the Bay Area is certainly a bubble in that respect. Um, but the vast majority of people still watch most of their TV live during prime time on cable, <laughs> on the big screen in the house, <laughs> which to me, I mean, also mind blowing, but you know, the numbers are out there. So yes, more and more people are paying for streaming services. More and more people are, are cutting the cord and not paying Comcast or Time Warner for, for cable, uh, DVRing stuff, all that kind of stuff. But it's still a very small fraction that are doing that compared to people sitting in front of their TV between 8 and 11 p.m. local time and watch the big screen. So cutting the cord refers to not paying for cable. So whether that's an antenna over the air or just using streaming services like Hulu, Amazon, Chromecast, Apple TV, any of that stuff. But basically it's the movement towards people not paying a cable bill anymore is what that refers to. Because of smart TVs. Because of the plethora of different things that you can watch TV on that aren't the cable company. 
Yeah. So what about if you if I had a TV that was compatible and I TiVo, I used TiVo, could mm -hmm. you also collect that data because it's not live then? That's right. Yeah. Anything that's on the screen, we try to match. And so yeah, if you TiVo or DVR, if you watch a DVD of something, we'll look it up in our uh, library, and if we see it then great, we match. If we don't see it, we immediately throw it away. So is that, that, that would apply to Netflix as well? Absolutely. And so I can get a little bit into the weeds if people are interested on how we build up that uh, library. But in short, we store everything that airs on uh, TV channels for about a week. And then everything else we kind of have to upload by hand into our system because we kind of we have capture all over the country. So basically I have computers watching TV 24-7 all over the country. Now we can't do that with Netflix. We can't have a computer watch everything on Netflix. That's way too much. But we can kind of manually put in things that we know are going to be popular. So big things from Netflix. So yeah, if you watch a really old episode of Friends, whether it's through Netflix or a DVD or something, it hasn't aired on TV in 20 years, we're probably not going to have that in our library, and so we just won't track that. So definitely it's not totally complete. For what airs on cable channels and network TV in the US, we're basically complete. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, so th that's uh, yeah. So that's interesting. So your uh, technology is uh, getting behind the TV. So you're actually able to get behind the app as well, mm -hmm. which is usually responsible for watching something like Netflix. Mm -hmm. So you're you're able to know even if they're watching Netflix. <coughs> is that Netflix giving you the data, or you're actually able to uh, sort of? Yeah, and you track what's happening behind the app. Yeah, so this is this is a touchy subject a bit. Uh, so we have direct uh, contracts with the TV manufacturers to our, put our software in their in the operating system of the TV. As I'm sure you know, Netflix has similar contracts with many TV manufacturers, as does Hulu. And so for a number of years, Netflix was the biggest gorilla on the block and could actually have its software take over other software. It was kind of messy behind the scenes. So we would get you know, some information. We might know that you're watching Netflix, but maybe not which show or something like that. Uh, as Netflix has been taking a bit of a beating from other streaming services, and as we've shown our value to the uh, TV manufacturers, et cetera, they're getting a little bit looser. And so newer, like their most uh, recent models, it's kind of a free for all. If you have one of these contracts with the TV provider or the TV manufacturer, your software is running, you've got very strict limits on how much power, bandwidth, all that kind of stuff. You know, we get a lot of information. So we're getting information of, yeah, you turned on Netflix, you were on the menu screen, because we have captures of what the menu screen kind of looks like. Um, if you watch, you know, Stranger Things, that was something that we ingested because we knew it was gonna be popular. We'll be able to track that. If you watch some really terrible Adam Sandler rom-com, like we didn't upload that, so we're not gonna be able to track that. Um, so we're being able to do more of that. Other companies are being able to do more of that. Netflix obviously still gets all of its own information, but it's being it's becoming a little bit more equal behind the scenes inside the TVs now. Hmm. And, yes, sir. So uh, a potential customer of yours would want to compare companies to see the quality of data. So is there kind of a standard scoring of the validation that you guys do, and how you how do you guys stand in that measure? So that's a great question. Uh, there are some um, like trade organizations, so media advertising trade organizations, who have tried to do this. And I know of two different instances, and it's failed miserably. <laughs> Just because there's, even on the like advertiser side, they can't all decide what they want to test, what they think the best metric is, right? Some people just say, most number of TVs. But as I said, you could throw in a ton of terrible TVs that don't do anything, that doesn't help you. And so there's, there wasn't even agreement on like the trade media advertising side on what they wanted to score things on, let alone all the companies, us and our competitors, of what we could produce. Because you know, to be fair, some are better in different circumstances than others. We think we're the best at many of them. Uh, but you know, there's some things that we're still working on. And so yeah, there's been attempts at something like that but not anything too independent. Uh, I've definitely been in client meetings where you know, I was told by my team, you know, our, our folks going in that like, oh, they're interviewing multiple companies, like they just met with our competitor yesterday. So we definitely know that that happens client by client. And so you know, I'm brought in to give a talk like this basically and talk about our panel and how it's representative and how we match the census nearly perfectly. 
and show those examples of, if you have too small of a panel, you'll get the wrong answer. If you have a big panel with a bunch of garbage, you'll get the wrong answer. And so that's a lot of what I spend my time doing in client calls uh, to try and get at that question of, you know, here's what we do, we're open about it, and we think it's right and good, ask our competitors. We've, you know, we've tried to get into conversations with them about this stuff, and they're not always very forthcoming, or they try to sweep stuff under the rug, and so it's a lot of that kind of shade, you know, trying to show, hey, we're open, here's what we do, we're honest, we show our numbers. If everyone else does that, then, you know, you, you figure out what you're scoring people on. Just to the extent the processes produce quality products, you may want to lock that with intellectual property. Yeah, yeah. So we have, I mean, we have a number of patents internally. We have a number of you know folks like Disney and other very big name clients who you know have a lot of sway in media and industry and have used us for a long time and really trust our numbers and you know have been impressed at how we've improved and added new features and new products over the years and things like that. Um, and you know I've I've seen a few times where somebody from one of those companies goes to another company that initially we did lose a deal to, and they're like, no, I only work with Samba. So some very good word of mouth actually within the industry. Uh, I've been very surprised, pleasantly surprised. I don't think that you know I expected it, but it's also nice to see like you know they they take those relationships pretty seriously. So that's good. Mm -hmm. Since the, the 2020 U.S. Census is coming, mm -hmm. and there'll be some at least a few controversial questions on the census, perhaps about citizenship, for example. Do you personally, or Samba, does Samba TV, care about adding questions to the census? I don't think so. Um, the main, you know, at least for the panel, which is what I mostly talked about and how we can do these kinds of uh, granular analyses of ethnicity, income, gender, age, and geography, um, we really just care, those are the most important features by far. And like I was saying earlier, those are the ones that get updated pretty often. Um, more than that gets updated. Stuff about like how many, uh, what kind of dwelling do you live in, you know, apartment, home, do you own? Some of those get updated more often as well um, than just every decade. And so at that level, that's, that's what we care about. That gets updated regularly, that's not really changing. Um, any other information, any kind of, you know, demographic, uh, like deeper demographic information or geography or uh, other personal information or, or habit information, that's going to come from these third-party data providers, the Experian, Epsilon, kind of credit card, credit score type companies, and they have tons of stuff. Um, they have more complete and probably better information than the U.S. Census can ever hope to have on things like that. Uh, so there's really no point, you know, th there's nothing that the census could really provide that would give us too much benefit overall. Um, if, you know, they put a census question about pets, like, okay, that's useful. You know, people sometimes want to have cat owners as a segment, like NFL viewers, and, you know, send them cat videos and cat, adver cat food advertisements. But we get that information through our third-party you know, data providers, the, the sort of credit card, credit score type people. Yeah. Do you give your data back to them? Is it a trade? Uh, it is not a trade. Um, we pay, we have contracts with third party data providers like at uh, Experian. Uh, we send them, or we send to a third party matching anonymized <coughs> matching company our identifiers. They, uh, Experian sends their identifiers, they match them mostly based off of IP address type stuff. And then they send us back basically just a match file of like, you know, Experian identifier, Samba identifier, and that's it. <laughs> Mm -hmm. No, so we don't sell, uh, so we sell uh, anonymized household level data to certain partners um, for viewership purposes. Um, those are large companies that want to know who's watching stuff. Uh, they aren't, we don't sell to that, like a data broker. We don't sell to any third party data providers. Um, it's the only contracts that we have that are the sort of household level um, anonymized data is with effectively advertiser companies. I think I can say McDonald's is one of them. I'm pretty sure I'm allowed to say that one. Um, but yeah, McDonald's recently spent a lot of money in the past year on their own data science team trying to figure out, you know, 
they advertise all over the place. You see the golden arches everywhere. Is it working? Is it pointless? Does everybody already know McDonald's? So, yeah, they're one of our big clients on, on that kind of data. Mm -hmm. So what if you have a freeze on your credit report with Experian? Can you still get some data from them? Ooh, I actually don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure how a credit freeze affects the, the kind of data that we get. We actually get, uh, I believe we get refreshes, like new refresh data from Experian, I think once a quarter, so every three months. Mm -hmm. um, so it does, you know, sort of, again, we have, you know, we have a calendar, uh, you know, reminder for like a bunch of people on my team of, hey, if we haven't gotten the new data, go bug experience, we're paying for it, and then we get a new refresh data, those matches oops, all get refreshed, we update all of our numbers, all of our code. Uh, but yeah, I'm not actually sure how uh, credit freeze affects that stuff. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Maybe I'll ask Experian the next time I'm on a call with those guys. As we prepare to give Dr. Silverman a final round of applause, please bear in mind some other institutions, individuals, to applaud. And that's the library here, the, the uh, Alameda Free Library, uh, also the Friends of the Library, and how about the Wonderfest patron, patrons? Uh, these are individuals that help keep Wonderfest alive. I hope you check wonderfest.org online and come back in a month or so for another Wonderfest event here at the library. And now, please, a final round of applause, Dr. Jeffrey Silverman.